Hi there, my name is Jonathan Roth. This is Cambridge House Live. I am joined now by Doug Casey. He is the founder and chairman of Casey Research. Doug, thanks very much for joining me. Pleasure, Jonathan. We are, uh, I think, poised for some really dangerous economic times, especially if I read what you're writing, and if I believe it, it would appear that we're on the precipice of something huge. Spell that out for me, unpack that. Yeah, uh, I believe that we entered something that I call the Greater Depression in 2007. And then we went through the leading edge of that storm in 2008, part of 2009, and it was grisly. It was unpleasant, it was grim. But as governments all over the world printed up trillions of currency units, Europe, China, Japan, the US, they papered it over. Uh, and they papered it over in the way that perhaps depositing $10,000 in everybody's bank account Monday morning would make everybody feel wealthier and make them feel good for a moment. But that's not a solution to the problem. So at this point, I think we're going back into the trailing edge of the hurricane, and it's going to be much worse, much more serious, and much longer lasting than what we saw in 2008 and 2009. So rigged for uh, heavy running, I'd say. Now, I'm going to start, start off with what's happening in Europe. Some people would say, and I, George Soros wrote a really interesting thing over the weekend, where he basically uh, stated that it would appear that, the, that the, uh, the euro was set up in such a way, the mechanism was set up in such a way to ensure that these crises would happen, and as each crisis would happen, that it would force more and more and more political integration. So in other words, to a certain extent, what we're seeing in Europe was engineered. What's your perspective on that? Well, first of all, let me start out with by saying that the euro, from its very conception, was a disaster. It was foredoomed to failure. It's like an Esperanto currency. Uh, it's if the dollar, the US dollar, is an IOU nothing on the part of a bankrupt government, then the euro is a who owes you nothing on the part of 20 even more bankrupt governments. So, no, it, it never could work uh, or, or will work. Uh, and it shouldn't be saved. Uh, this whole idea, I mean, uh, you have to get back to essentials. You have to get radical, which is to say get to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is that all of the world's currencies are fiat currencies. They're political constructions created by governments, created by central banks. They're nothing but paper. Uh, money is a medium of exchange and a store of value. It should be a commodity that can't be created out of thin air right. by a government. So of course the, Europe, uh, the euro is going to dry up and blow away. And I think the EU is going to disappear as well. You think it's going to disintegrate? Of course it will, uh, because all of these countries in Europe are radically different cultures with different problems and you can't put them together. In fact, the ideal political situation in the world, right now we have 200 some countries in the world. To me, the ideal political situation is we had 7 billion separate countries. In other words, the idea of the nation state itself is an anachronism that's going to go away in the years to come. Trying to find a one-size-fits-all for millions of people and control them with government coercion is not only uh, unethical, but it's impractical. So you feel that, I mean, we've already entered into the era of the individual in terms of, you know, our, our persona online, everything else, the individual is becoming more and more you know, central to the, to the way society operates. But you actually are taking that a lot, uh, quite a few steps further. Yes, of course. Uh, I don't believe, uh, and this is going to sound outlandish to most of your listeners, but I don't believe in the right of the nation state as an entity to exist. Uh, I don't think that uh, government, in point of fact, serves a useful purpose. In point of fact, there's nothing that individuals need or want that are not provided by other individuals, often organized into corporations and so forth. 
but government as an entity is just a dead hand on society. But unfortunately today, most people conflate government with society. They're two totally different entities. So you see absolutely no role for government in society? No, and the reason I mean, I, roads, schools, hospitals. No, no, and I know, well, who's going to provide sure. the roads? I mean, roads? the building we're in right now, this is funded by the, the province of British Columbia. Yeah, but it was built with capital that was extracted from the citizens of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. It was built by private contractors, and it would have been built by a private company for for a, uh, a, a profit if the government hadn't preempted that, that role for them. Hmm. Okay. Absolutely. And, and asking who's going to build the roads is very much the same kind of question that the Russians asked before, uh, to, before uh, 1991. Well, if the government did, didn't build our Moscovich and a lot of cars, what would we drive? Hmm. And it's exactly the same, uh, the same problem. You, you have to look at the nature of government as an institution. And it's the only institution that is pure coercion. It's like Mao Te Tung said, it comes out of the barrel of a gun. There's no volunteerism about government. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got two types of people in the world, people that believe in dealing with their fellows voluntarily or coercively. And the people that like government, that approve of it, believe that it's possible and you should deal with people coercively. Now, you can make an argument that uh, since government is pure coercion, maybe it ought to be there to defend you from other people initiating coercion. That implies police to defend you from that within its bailiwick, sure. an army to protect you from outside predators, and perhaps a court system to allow you to adjudicate disputes without resorting to coercion. Although, and I can live in a society like that, but in point of fact, those functions are so important that I don't want to trust them to the kind of people that are inevitably drawn to government. Hmm. Okay, I, I, want to, I want to stop you right there because you wrote something really interesting just recently about the fact that sociopaths are attracted to roles in government. Yes. So clear, I think that you, you're not quite, you weren't quite spelling it out there, but I think what you're saying is, is that you feel as if you don't trust those in government because just by the nature of what that job entails, mm -hmm. they tend to be sociopaths and they lead us in a dangerous direction. And in some cases, as you spelled out with some individuals like Robert McNamara and such, who you actually spell out as being evil in terms of what they do to further their own ends. Yeah, sure. Uh, government draws criminal personalities by its nature the way um, a certain substance draws flies. It's, they gravitate towards a place where they can concentrate their efforts on controlling other people as opposed to trying to control physical reality. Mm -hmm. So it, it draws the wrong kind of people. We call those people sociopaths, mm -hmm. people that relate in a, a coercive manner with others. It's, it's where they live. And at a certain point, when government gets big enough and becomes corrupt enough, sociopaths start coming out from under rocks and exposing themselves and going to government and they drive the good people that may be in government that have good intentions. I don't want to be around these people and they leave and then you get the kind of situation that you had in the Soviet Union, you had in Nazi Germany, you had in Pol Pot's Cambodia and many, many other type of things. At a certain point there's a tipping point and it, it goes over the edge. Uh, are so, we... so what's your perspective on Barack Obama then? I think he's, um... look, is he worse than the baby Bush that came before him? I'm not sure, he's got the same policies as Bush. Is he worse than, uh, than Romney who may succeed him? I think Romney may be worse than Obama. Uh, he's... You think he might be? I mean, here's my question for you because it's interesting, you, you know, how you define someone working in, in government tends to be a sociopath. And you know that uh, this has really come up in the news here lately. New York Times did a, a huge uh, uh, article about it. The fact that Barack Obama is, it seems as if, seems to be the sole decider on some of these drone attacks that are going into other countries like Yemen and Pakistan. Mm. And in fact, you know, when he, uh, some people would say he killed, some people would say he assassinated, some would say he murdered. 
an American citizen who was allegedly a part of Al Qaeda, but he made that decision. He made that call. Sure. I mean, to, I'm, I'm just putting the connecting no. the dots together, and I yeah. would say that from your point of view, you would say that Barack yes. Obama might be a sociopath. It's completely, it, it's criminal to go out and kill somebody based on an allegation, and you don't even know when you're using drones whether it's actually that person you're killing and all the people around him who they are. I mean, uh, this is out of control, and it's, it's, it's getting worse because there's no widespread protest. People aren't turning out into the streets uh, to protest this. Why no, not? it's, Why it's not? very disturbing. Why, huh. Why not? Why not? Why aren't people turning out into the streets? Because they would if George W. Bush was doing it. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. I don't know. Are there more people taking Prozac now than there used to be under Bush? It's a good question. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's, uh, you know, we've laid out a case in terms of what's going on in Europe. Obviously, the United States has a lot of fiscal problems. You know, they're going to hit the wall here sooner or later. Um, a lot of change when it comes to societies, you know, a lot of this turmoil that we see happening, eventually there's some sort of resolution. And oftentimes that resolution is war. And you have yourself has predicted you're expecting World War III to happen at some point. I don't know if soon is the right word to use, but at some point in the near future, but you've always said that it was going to originate out of the Middle East. What's your perspective when you're taking all these, you have Europe, you have the United States, the Middle East situation, you put them all together and you, Well, what, what do you think is going to happen? Well, in the to war start front? with, when the going gets tough, governments like to blame somebody else for the economic problems that they cause. And sometimes they'll blame people within their society the way the, the Nazis did, but more often, or in addition to that sometimes, they'll blame people from outside. It's those damn Chinese that are creating all kinds of cheap products that are putting our workers out of business. Actually, the Chinese are heroes for making cheaply available products at, at, the, at the right price. Heroes. Heroes, they're heroes. But they'll be blamed for these problems, right. perhaps. Right. And uh, that's how wars get started. And it's very likely that the, U the U.S. is really just asking for trouble. It's got a gigantic, bloated military right now that the average American just loves. They've apotheosized the military, even though half of the military spending in the world is done by the U.S. So the U.S. military has become like a, a, a huge gold-plated hammer. And when you have a hammer like that, everything starts looking like a nail in addition to the fact that they're in a hundred countries around the world antagonizing the natives. Nobody likes to see foreign soldiers kicking down the doors of, of especially if they're teenagers from a, an alien country, kicking down the doors in the middle of the night. And there will be blowback from that. So uh, why should this be the first time in history when there's not a major war? I think the trend's in motion for something. I don't know exactly who it's going to be with or exactly when it's going to start, but um, I'm not looking forward to it. Mm. Yeah, obviously not. Now, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the U.S. dollar. Um, is it active U.S. policy to debase the U.S. dollar? It certainly would appear that it is. I mean, they're, they're continuing to print money, but um, I guess it, that's, that's a statement. Now, let's move over to the question part of that. So if they are actively uh, trying to destroy the value of the U.S. dollar, what does that mean for the United States when, it, when the U.S. dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency? Well... In real terms, what does that mean when they cannot finance their debts anymore? Well, look at it this way. Uh, there are more or less about seven trillion U.S. dollars outside of the U.S. owned by foreigners. And that's been a, on the surface, a wonderful thing for the citizens of the U.S because those nice foreigners have been shipping in huge amounts of, of Mercedes and Sonys and cocaine and I don't know what else we import from foreign countries. And we paid for it just by printing up paper. So now there are these trillions of dollars outside the U.S. and they're owned by people who don't have to use the U.S. dollar the way U.S. citizens can. And they're increasingly viewing the U.S. dollar as a hot potato. And when they start unloading those U.S. dollars, like hot potatoes, they're going to wind up back in the U.S. 
what's going to happen? The dollars come back into the U.S. in exchange for what? Titles to companies, title to real estate, titles to produce. Inflation will explode within the U.S. Standard of living will collapse for American citizens, just like it's been artificially boosted by the export of those dollars. It'll go into reverse. So to, it's, what, to what degree on the inflation front? Zimbabwe-style inflation or? Well, you can't really predict uh, the degree that this is going to happen to, but uh, all these popular economists are of a Keynesian persuasion. People like Paul Krugman, who uh, he's not an economist to start with. An economist is somebody that can predict. He, he, that, won, a, he won a Nobel Prize. Somebody thought he won. That's meaningless because the Nobel Prizes for peace and economics and literature are artificial popularity contests. They're not like the Nobel Prizes for chemistry and physics. They're totally different. When you look at the people that have won these prizes, I mean, I mean uh, they're embarrassments, like Stiglitz was another recent one that for some reason was given it. Uh, no, an economist is somebody that can not just predict the direct and immediate consequences of action, which any intelligent six-year-old can do, he can predict the indirect and delayed consequences of actions. An economist is somebody that can accurately describe the way the world works. Uh, it's not somebody that can deal in mathematical formulas uh, uh, that have no relationship to human action. So no, Stig uh, uh, Krugman, mm -hmm. he's not an economist, he's a political apologist, he's a political hack. Uh, a glib one, I've got to say. But uh, no, he's not an economist. So, get, so getting back to the inflation question then, so, but you don't see, you can't really predict in terms of what's going to happen on the inflation front. No, because I can't accurately predict what 300 million people in the U.S. exactly what they're going to do and when, or what 7 billion people in the world are, are, are going to do. And especially I can't exactly predict what various governments are going to do, especially since they actually don't know what they're doing. They're run by people devoid of economic knowledge and with a heavy sprinkling of criminal personalities. So it's going to be, I, I can only predict that we're likely to see genuine financial and economic chaos over the next decade. And this depression that started in 2007 is going to last, I think, much longer than the depression that started in 1929. That lasted until 1946. This one could go on much longer and be much more severe. And why do I say that? Because this time, especially, governments are much more powerful than they were in those days, number one. And now they're not only doing the wrong things, they're doing the exact opposite of the right things. So um, it's going to be grim. There's a lot of good news on the horizon. I'm not trying to paint a, a one-sidedly gloomy picture. I'm painting a gloomy picture just from a political point of view. But unfortunately, uh, politics is overwhelming in its influence today, much more than at any time in the past. Well, they have, they have a lot more mechanisms to make that happen now oh, that we didn't yeah, have much before. And, and, and the average person has come to look on the government as being a cornucopia. And this was not the case during the last depression. People were much more self-sufficient and the government didn't do the kind of things it does today. So, no. Well, well here I'm gonna. I'm taking a step further from where you're talking. What you're what you're saying right now. You wrote something really interesting uh, just very recently. You said that intellectually and morally, uh, that society, sorry, has been intellectually and morally bankrupt for some time. Mm -hmm. Taking what you just said in terms of how maybe society was structured in the 1920s and the 1930s, maybe how the family unit was put together and all that, and we see what's happening now, we see what's going on in the financial situation. There's a problem going on in society there. You've, you've defined it, that it's intellectually and morally bankrupt. Why is that the case? What has led us to that point, you think? Well, there are all kinds of uh, collectivist, statist ideas that have been infused into society where people actually believe that Keynesian economics is economics, which it's not. Uh, and there are all kinds of beliefs in society where 
well, who was it? It was um, Will Rogers that said, it's not what people believe, what did he say? It's, it's not what people don't know that's the problem, it's what people think they know right. that just ain't so. Like, another example of this is almost everybody wants to go to college today. They think it's going to improve their situation. But first of all, when most North Americans go to college, they don't learn something that takes a discipline like chemistry or physics or any other science. They mostly take soft studies, English literature, political science, gender studies, sociology. And the people that teach these subjects in particular almost universally have the wrong kind of attitudes. And by that I'd say that they believe in the state as a cornucopia, and they don't believe in the individual, they believe in the collective. And this has corrupted intellectually several generations of people who don't really think for themselves as a result and tend to believe it because everybody else has tended to believe it. And worse than that, it's been the whole college experience has been financially corruption because people get out of college and they, they're basically indentured servants. They have 10, 20, 50, even $100,000 worth of debt. I don't know how they're going to get out from under that. It's so immense so them into the system. It's really, in a way, it's systemic. That's, it is. It's, that's the root of the problem. The problem is systemic at this point, intellectually and spiritually, even. Uh, so. That's interesting. Go down that road for a little bit. Well, when I say spiritually, I mean from a moral, from an ethical point of view. Uh, I think the average guy believes that things are right when I, at least I would say, they're wrong. Um, Is it because we don't have the right leaders showing us the right way? Well, you know, a poor quality of leadership doesn't help. Uh, I don't think Cambodia would have gone crazy like it did if you hadn't had a sociopath like Pol Pot running it. Sure. I don't think uh, Russia would have gone uh, off the deep end if you didn't have a, a madman like Stalin running it. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, these people only get into office because the average guy concedes that they're okay and allows them to do it. And uh, I, I think that uh, the average American, the average Canadian, is really no better than the average Russian or the average Cambodian. I mean, so I, I'm not terribly optimistic about this. This is one reason why I recommend that uh, people diversify their assets and themselves internationally. So that if something goes terribly wrong in the country where you're born and where you live, you don't have to be washed away with the tidal wave. You can pick up and go someplace else where the well, prospects are better. Well, look, you've, you've put your money where your mouth is because you, you have this development down in Argentina, mm -hmm. which I'm curious about. But obviously, Argentina's in the news a lot. We just had Ross Beatty up here, mm -hmm. you know, within the last hour or two. Mm -hmm. And he's got a company, that a copper company that has, you know, huge asset and resources down there. Uh, and they're running into some real headwinds with Argentina nationalizing the Spanish oil company and such. Mm -hmm. No, the, the I mean, is there really a safe haven anywhere when no, you really, you the, the know? answer to the question is no. There is no yeah. safe haven anywhere uh, today. And all of these governments all over the world, it's not just the Americans and the Argentines that are going off the deep end. It's happening all over the world. The state is in the ascendant now all over the world. And why am I in Argentina? Well, I've been to 175 countries. I've lived in 12 places. Our, I spend a lot of time in Argentina and we're doing uh, that development down there, which is, I would, it, it may be the best development in the world at any price. And uh, you say, well, why didn't you pick a country that was more stable? Well, I've looked at all the other places and governments come and go. And the current government in Argentina will go just because they're so stupid and destructive. And I, I'm hoping that the next one might be much better, radically better. Look, I lived in New Zealand uh, for, uh, for uh, 
for years. And um, New Zealand in the mid 80s was becoming the shallow end of the gene pool. It was actually the first socialist country in the world. And anybody with any brains and the money to buy airfare to Los Angeles or anywhere was, was bailing out. It was, it was uh, suffering from a genuine brain drain. So by the mid 80s, they said, you know what? This can't go on. Uh, so they fired two thirds of the government employees. They cut the income tax 50%. They eliminated import duties. And now New Zealand's actually a very nice place to hang out. I'm hoping that that help, happens to Argentina. And because the current government is so destructive and counterproductive, although they leave you alone. If you're a foreigner, I wouldn't want to be in Argentine, but if you're a foreigner that's living there and bringing in dollars, they really leave you alone. It's very pleasant from that point of view. But I'm, I'm hoping that they have a counter-revolution the way New Zealand did in the years to come. Now, I, I have one minute left, and I, we have talked a lot, of, a lot about doom and gloom, but the reality is, is that you have an interesting vision in terms of what you see happening in the longer term, that you're somewhat fairly, you know, you're optimistic. Yeah, I am. So in, in a minute or less, tell me why you are. I'm optimistic for two reasons, both because the average person wants to improve his status, and the way he does that is by producing more than he consumes and saving the difference. That creates capital. So that's going to continue, because that's just part of the human nature of most decent human beings, number one. And number two, that capital very often is put into technology. And that has wound up the mainspring of progress. And technology is going to continue expanding, because there are more scientists and engineers alive today than have ever lived in all of history put together. So they're going to be continuing, hopefully making gigantic breakthroughs that will eventually allow us to live for not just three score and ten years, but maybe hundreds of years. And our destiny as humans is in the stars. So don't be discouraged by the fact that we're going into a greater depression right now. It's just a bump in the road. And the future is not only going to be better than you imagine, or I imagine, it's probably going to be better than we can imagine. Hmm. Interesting. Well, look, I think that's a great way to end off. I really appreciate your time today and look forward to the next conversation. Thanks, John.